Mr. Marquis, thank you so much for joining me here on the podcast. I want to dive right into capital punishment because I know you're a supporter of capital punishment. Pew Research in June 2021 put out research um, stating most Americans favor the death penalty despite concerns about its administration. 64% roughly either somewhat favor or strongly favor the death penalty. And originally I thought this was just for the United States, but it's not. Here in Canada, 51% of Canadians support uh, capital punishment, either somewhat or very strongly support it. And yet in my conversations with people, there's almost this blasphemy bringing up capital punishment, that if you support it, you're kind of supporting barbarism in a way. And I'm sure you have experienced this as well. And I wanted to know your thoughts on this discrepancy between what people actually say on polls versus what they say in person to each other when it comes to capital punishment. I think there are a few subjects about which Americans in particular, and probably North Americans, including Canadians, and then probably extending to some extent across the pond to, um, to people in Britain, um, feel almost as sort of like political pornography, uh, things you just don't say. Um, I grew up in a in a intellectual upper middle class, very liberal home. And my parents were, I remember uh, putting a bumper sticker on my dad's car when I was 11 years old and the death penalty was last up for uh, uh, repeal in Oregon that said repeal the death penalty. And, you know, I completely, of course, I'm 11, 12 years old, but, you know, I listened to what they said. It made sense to me. And Oregon then subsequently returned the death penalty in 1974 and 77 again in 84. And after I became a prosecutor in roughly 1980, I found my views changing. But um, you're absolutely right. One of the things that's not understood is just taking the Western world, um, virtually polls taken in all of Europe and North America and South America show virtually all, if you just poll people generally, support ranges from 52 to 70 percent for the death penalty conceptually, meaning is there any circumstance in which you can imagine the state willfully taking someone's life as a punishment for a particularly heinous murder? Now, of course, there are places where people get the death penalty for something less than murder, but in the United States, it's impossible. The Supreme Court has said for some time now, the only crime you can get it, and technically for treason, but we haven't had anybody tried for that in 220 years. Uh, but if you look at the other countries in Western Europe, the only place where there was popular opposition to the death penalty was France. Um, in Britain, Italy, Germany, um, it was somewhere between a, a five and 15 point spread. Um, there's one reason which I don't think applies in North America so much, but it bleeds over. And that is, uh, you know, the, the real leaders of post-war Europe have been Italy and Germany. Uh, they were also two of the you know, fascist superpowers in World War II, uh, both of whom, particularly Germany, engaged in mass murder for uh, racial reasons and reasons of hatred. So a nation like that has a lot of reasons for withdrawing from the death penalty. Um, I mean, in, within the memory of many people, they were engaged in mass mur government murder. And one can always make the point that even an enlightened government like Canada with say some of the first people's issues, you know, there's a scandal right now, I think in one of the provinces about um, uh, deaths, but, but we're talking, you know, on a meta scale. And the fact of the matter is that in virtually all of the world, even more so in the non-Western world, which our media tends to concentrate on, um, there is generally support for the death penalty. People just don't like talking about it. If you move to east, the Eastern Hemisphere, and why not? I mean, if, you know, one of the classic things that liberals say is, oh, we're too ethnocentric and we're too tied to, you know, Euro, white Euro values and may be true, although it's where most of us come from. Um, but, you know, two of the largest nations who currently use the death penalty are democracies and they are India and Japan. And you very often will see a statement saying the United States is the only uh, nation or developed nation in the world that uses the death penalty, or certainly the only democracy. And of course, that's simply not true. 
And India's democracy may be chaotic and you may not like uh, Boda or whatever his name is, but the Japanese have a system that's almost identical to the US because we set it up for them in 1947. And, um, and then it, you go to the Islamic countries and you know death is a not uncommon penalty for things much less than, than, than murder. So there's a certain a ethnocentricity about it. Um, and it's a complicated issue because in Europe, where the European common market was formed, one of the conditions for entering the EC was that you renounce the death penalty. So for countries like, you know, Bulgaria, uh, Kosovo, not a good example, but larger ones, but uh, certainly any of the former Eastern Bloc countries and even some of the Western Bloc countries, uh, if they wanted in um, because of the historic detrius of World War II and the death penalty, that was an easy call. You know, you, are you going to have a, a capital punishment that you're very, very rarely going to use and be labeled a pariah nation, or are you going to join the community of nations and more importantly, enrich your, 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 uh, your citizens? So, and so many of these decisions have been made around the world without any regard to the main issues, which is, is it, does it mean anything? Um, and, and then of course, there's even arguments about what that means. I don't, I believe that there are, is a, a general deterrent to the death penalty, but that's not the main reason I support it. I support it because of his specific deterrence and uh, in the sense that the person who committed the heinous murder will hopefully eventually be executed and he won't kill any more people. And there are many, many, many examples in the United States of people uh, either getting away with murder on the first part or actually being convicted and let out of prison and going back and killing sometimes many more people when they're given the opportunity. It's not everybody, but um, you know, you have to say to a system, uh, look, you knew this guy was a vicious murderer. He's been found guilty of it. You said you were gonna keep him in prison for life and now you let him out after 15 years. And so why are you surprised? Yeah, you're you're uh, it's fascinating uh Mr. Marquis as a retired district attorney. Um I'd love to further explore your insights because you know, I've I've seen I've read a lot of your work and and a lot of uh, folks that disagree and even uh there are many legal experts that that argue, you know, is 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 a life sentence uh is that worse than the death penalty in in many ways. Yeah. But I wanted to get back to the the um, you know the 60-40, 50-50, 70-30 split when it comes to capital punishment and support or somewhat uh, support that uh, generally citizens across at least the G7 countries, and certainly I would extend that to the G20, um, have when it comes to capital punishment. It's If it were 90-10 or 80-20, I would understand why it would be hard to find um, individuals like yourself. Uh, that are uh, openly in support of capital punishment, but because it's it's so divided down the lines, I'm surprised how hard it was for me in particular to find yourself and your work. I think I was telling you before the show that I had to go 20, 30 pages deep into Google to find uh, uh, individuals who were supportive of capital punishment. And even then it was uh, folks who were cited but by somebody who was um, opposed to capital punishment. So they would say folks like Joshua Marquis say X, Y, and Z. And I found that fascinating because there's a lot of research on why the capital, capital punishment should not be legal, but yet I go on Pew Research and so many other polls and we are divided almost straight down the line when it comes to capital punishment. Why do you think that is? I know that's a loaded question, but why do you think- Well, it's I think it's two things. For one thing, um, there are ebbs and flows in politics and I'm old enough to have lived through a few of them. Yeah. And in the United States and you know, Canada is similar, you have different pressures. But in the United States, uh, support for the death penalty was fairly high at and right after World War II. And then as, um, as the 60s wore on, which also coincided with the civil rights movement and many other you know, social movements, support for the death penalty dropped for the first time in the last hundred years, below the 50-50 mark in probably about 1962 or 63. Uh, in my state, in Oregon, which is a state of about 5 million people in the Northwest, 
Um, the last time any state, this is something that's very little known or never paid attention to by the mass media, the last time any uh, population in America voted to abolish the death penalty was 1964 in Oregon. Ever since then, every single time a state has been asked, they have said the opposite. Now, some people say, oh, well, that was because it was 50 years ago. No, in the last 10 years alone, there were two separate efforts just in the last six years in California, probably the most politically progressive liberal state in the United States, ethnically very diverse, mm -hmm. and both efforts to abolish the death penalty failed. In Nebraska, um, the legislature in 2016, uh, which was largely Republican, although they claim not to have political, they have a unicameral legislature that's very odd, Anyway, they overwhelmingly abolished the death penalty and the voters came back six months later and overwhelmingly reinstated it. Wow. I mean, there's just story like this after story in the United States. So hmm. um, I remember right after Timothy McVeigh was executed, he was the uh, Oklahoma City bomber and one of the few people in the United States that, you know, a lot of people agreed it did something so terrible that he might even should, should get the death penalty. He got it. And because he waived his appeals, he was actually executed. Mm -hmm. So they were doing interviews with um, English language international broadcasters like Deutsche Welle and Rai Radio Televisione Italiana. And um, I was watching the, a guy who a year later I was having dinner with, the head of Amnesty International. And I think he's Dutch or was Dutch. And he was saying in somewhat broken English, something that I've never forgotten and I thought was really quite brilliant. He says, well, the difference is that in America, you have the people ahead of the leaders, whereas in Europe, we have the leaders ahead of the people. Hmm. Now, I'm not sure what he's exactly trying to say, but he was, what he was saying was right. In an elitist uh, slash Republican form of government where people who are elected you know, you know, don't ask for referendums. You elect them because they're wise and they're learned, et cetera. All across the West, including the United States, those people are generally opposed to the death penalty. They're generally upper middle class. Um, they are generally utterly unaffected by crime. Mm -hmm. And they see it as a, you know, philosophical issue, not, not a real life issue. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, they've made it a, um, a litmus test for whether or not in politics you can move forward. There was a time in America, even as late as maybe the 1990s, where a politician who didn't at least say the death penalty should be available was in trouble. Now you have people running for the office of prosecutor, which I realize is an anomaly in the rest of the world except America, but mm -hmm. I did seven times. And many of the people running for prosecutor are not even willing to commit to enforcing the law in those 30 states that still do have the death penalty. Wow. So the, the long, it was a long answer. The short answer is, I think that there's a, a cultural uh, mark against stating how you believe on that. And I'm sure if I was more clever, I could think of a few other social conventions. I mean, some of them, um, I think we all agree with, you don't want people to call people racist, bad names. You don't want people to be rude, but we, I think, would aspire to people being honest about what they feel or believe. And in an increasingly partisan uh, media that where the, where the distinction between news and information and entertainment are all wiped away, there's just what you were talking about with Google. I mean, you shouldn't, you know, the, when it's true, there are very few scholars who write about what I do. Uh, but it's a major issue, and it should be easy to, to, to get both uh, opinions. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the book that I is here somewhere, <laughs> I don't have any continuing legal interest in this. They paid me very nicely. Yeah. It's called Debating the Death Penalty. It's got six essays in it, three in favor and three against. And I understand that it's still used in colleges and law schools, but you know, you're right. You're not the first person who is a student, scholar, reporter, who's, report, who's come to me and said, gee, I you know, stumbled across this. And 
that's a little concerning in, our, in, in free societies as you know, the United States and Canada and most of Western Europe are. It, it, you know, ideas shouldn't be corralled. I mean, I suppose you could have things that are so repugnant and repulsive that you, know, you don't want people advocating for them, but this is not one of those. Especially given your um, the, the research that you've put forward, the, what you've written, uh, Supreme Court justices who've, who've cited your work, um, I, I just think that it's it's such a grave injustice to to have that bearing. Well, it, but it's treated. I can tell you because I've been involved on in this. I, I'll give you an example that I don't. I haven't written much about because it's kind of personal. But in two thousand two, um, at that point, I had testified a couple times before Congress. I'd published. I, I'd become nationally known for my advocacy, and the university that I graduated from with honors and what graduated from law school, the university where my father was a dean and uh, is, although he's been dead for 20 years, is still very well known. That university sponsored a symposium on capital punishment. It just so happened that I was the state president of the Prosecuting Attorneys Association. Mm -hmm. And so I learned about this. It was being put on by my law school, my alma mater. And I realized when I saw the preliminary that it was all one side. And wow. so I wrote a letter to the dean saying, you know, I think the title was death penalty, abolition, uh, you know, elimination or moratorium. And it was like, well, how about, you know, <laughs> keeping it? Just, shouldn't that yeah. be an option? And I essentially shamed uh, my alma mater into uh, offering a tiny bit and they reached out, they, they asked me for names. They said, well, who, I guess from what you're saying, you could yeah. probably take the position that, well, it's hard to find advocates. So, yeah. but I, you know, I gave them three names and addresses right off the top. And, but it was one of the most unpleasant experiences I've ever had. Mm -hmm. um, maybe partly because it was a university that I was part of and my father was part of, uh, but it was extremely hostile insulting at times. Wow. Um, at one point, I was on a couple sub panels. And somebody said something to me about something called the Liebman study, which is a, a, a study that gets dragged up about every five years, written largely by a Columbia law professor named James Liebman. And the questioner stood up and said, well, do you know anything about the Liebman study? Because it sounds like you don't. And I had the Liebman study literally on the floor. And I said, yeah, I have the Liebman study here. And I think I'm quoted about 10 times in it, but no, I don't agree with it. Or Mr. Marquis, are, are you a liar or a red baiter? Hmm. And I just said, no. So I, this is an adult. And then something interesting happened. I noticed some law students coming up to me and kind of apologizing for the behavior of the elders, meaning the people my age, and I noticed, I started paying attention. I noticed there was a distinct difference from the was younger people who were in law school who were generally respectful. And many of the older uh, participants, many of whom were academics. And it turns out the guy who had been so insulting to me is a very well-known sociologist who claims to be a great expert on the death penalty, who apparently felt badly enough about it that he came up to me at a, at a reception the next night and sort of privately apologized. For, you know, being such a jerk. Wow. I said, I said, you know, the the point I said, and I realize I'm somebody who thrives on conflict. I like mixing it up with people. Uh, that's why I've enjoyed being a trial lawyer. Most people are not like that. Most, the vast majority of people, certainly scholars. I mean, my father was a teacher and I know other people that are teachers. They do not thrive on conflict. And if the environment is hostile enough, uh, particularly in academia, it's just going to vanish. It's just not going to happen. Um, and some people say, well, that's good because that's an unacceptable viewpoint. Mm. And um, I don't, don't think it is. And, you know, the, you brought up the fact that, you know, in state after state, in nation after nation, if you do honest polling and you, you, you don't set up an answer like, you know, do you think small young children should be tortured and then killed for things they're not in, guilty of? No, I really think that's a bad idea. I mean, <laughs> The question is, it's traditionally asked by the um, Gallup organization is, is terrible, even worse than this. They ask the question is, should 
people convicted of murder be executed? Now, if you were to ask me that question, the way it's phrased, I'd say normally no, because 95% of murders should not get the death penalty. Their crimes aren't heinous enough, even if they have a bad background. But by framing the question that way, there's a, a, a Canadian-based pollster, who, and these polls are now about 10 years out of date, but they asked the question in a very, very straightforward way of saying, should there ever be the death penalty for any form of murder? And in the, it was a national poll, 85% of the respondents said yes. Hmm. So one of the reasons this Pew poll is so interesting is that the conventional wisdom in American media for 10, 15, 20 years getting worse has been that the death penalty is a completely outdated Neanderthal, uh, brutal instrument that no civilized or decent person would advocate, and that it's widely acknowledged that it's a bad idea, and that you know generally it has the opprobrium of nations around the world. That's, That's not true. <laughs> Right. And uh, Mr. Marquis, you know, when I when I wanted to when I thought about doing this podcast with yourself, I, I didn't want to boil the ocean, didn't want to go down uh, too many rabbit holes with it with capital punishment, as you know, because there's so much complexity to, to this as a district attorney, you know, and I've I've watched your debates, I've read your research, there's just too much complexity to, to get all all through that in a in a podcast. And so That's instead, true. what I wanted to do with you you've brought up very specific points on capital punishment that I think more people need to hear. And one point that resonates that resonated with me was the internal capacity of the legal system. In March 2012, you testify in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee and you raise such a fascinating point. You say, in order for the justice system to work right, you need good lawyers on both sides. In public service law, there are many non-monetary rewards, but new attorneys incur enormous student loan debts, often exceeding $100,000. They enter professions that might pay them that amount after a decade or more, if they're fortunate. And, you know, it's such an important point. That point right there is so critical because I find when it comes to capital punishment, there's a, a, a microscope on innocence and the, on the verdict of innocence or guilt. And if you just think about it from the from the perspective of the lawyer who's incurred so much debt and is now in a position where they need to uh, uh, undertake public service law, it if if their debt is overwhelming and their salaries are lower, their attention to detail may not very well be there. And that's such a critical point that is so overlooked when it comes to. Uh, capital punishment debates, that capacity of the legal system to make sure that lawyers are being compensated adequately to try these cases. And so I want to know from you, what can governments do to address that particular piece when it comes to internal capacity? And we'll get to other pieces of internal capacity in a bit. Well, a, a lot, you know, this has been a problem in the United States for a very long time, which is that the traditional way we usually uh, reward or measure success is how much money you can make and how financially well you can be. But there are many other rewards and many other reasons. People don't become ministers yeah. or teachers to become super wealthy. And most people maybe who want to be, maybe most people in law school want to become super wealthy, but they're not going to. Uh, but the clearly the two absolute lowest paying subspecialties in the law are professional prosecutors and professional public defenders. Um, I mean, by a huge margin. I mean, I never made more than $155,000 a year. And that was after, you know, 30, 40 years of practice and presumably at the top of my profession. Um, and that in the around the United States, that's probably you know, the most a prosecutor makes is there's a few cities where they make 200,000, the prosecutor. But the average salary of a prosecutor is more like $100,000. And, and, and by the way, when I said that in 2012, I'm, I used the debt figure of 100,000 as an extreme level. It's not extreme anymore. That's considered average now, yeah. which I find mind boggling. Yeah. And so, the, so you have two problems 
one, two with defense and two with prosecution regarding this. For prosecutors, it used to be in the United States, I'd say before maybe 1985, that it was traditional to go to work in a prosecutor's office for maybe three years, learn how to try a case, you know, get your name around, and then you went into private practice and made a lot more money, whatever you did, criminal work, personal injury, whatever, because staying in the DA's office was a dead end politically and uh, f certainly financially. Um, and, and, and so that's changed a lot. Uh, prosecutors are paid better. In the United States, there was a huge reexamination of sort of law enforcement that begat a, a program called the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration. Mm -hmm. I got several of my student loans forgiven for years of active service in a law enforcement agency, the DA's office, before I even became a lawyer. And so then the problem is, how do you keep people in it? Um, because the, the salary, and again, you say $150,000, most people say, oh, that's fine. I'd be happy to work for that. Well, what happens? I mean, in my case, where my friends from law school, if you take five of them, uh, I'm definitely the one who's getting paid the least. The next lowest is 200,000 above me, and it goes up from there. Wow. Now, so other factors come in. I mean, I, I got married late in life, and my wife and I don't have kids, so I don't have to worry about that. Um, and, and so I had sort of the luxury of doing a job I love. So there is still, and, and the problem of student debt, um, I was talking to my successor uh, last month, and he's having tremendous problems recruiting prosecutors because of the debt load and because they can make so much more money. Now flip over to the defense side, they have some of the same problems. Um, there is there's huge coin in being a lawyer in, uh, and learning how to be a trial lawyer. I mean, that's really considered sort of the, the top level, no matter what kind of law you practice, because it's, it's the closest thing to sort of combat you can get in in an intellectual sense. Mm -hmm. And um, so a lot of people are interested in being public defenders, and they have no trouble recruiting. Same problem, retention, because um, even if they want to stay in criminal law and become criminal defense attorneys, they'll make a lot more money. So I don't think you can just put up financial, but if, if we are aware of this and aware that, well, you know, clearly, particularly if you get to a capital level case, the person certainly deserves at least competent uh, uh, representation and competent in, in the context of a death penalty case. There, like I said, in my state in Oregon, there are no more than 125 lawyers of 15,000 who are capable of either prosecuting or defending a case, wow. a capital case. And uh, now that doesn't mean we're better lawyers than the others, but it's kind of like a very specific kind of brain surgery where um, you know neurosurgery is a small subset uh, among physicians. Now, I, neurosurgeons all think they're better than anybody else. And in the legal profession, I will tell you, trial lawyers think of themselves as the, you know, the uh, uh, apex predator of the, and that may or may not be true. But the fact of the matter is you're going to have a relatively small pool to do it. And the reason they call it practicing law is the only way you get good at it is to do it again and again. So um, there's no such thing as a whiz-bang prosecutor or defense attorney who graduates from law school, like in so many John Grisham books or movies, and is instantly capable of spinning a jury on its head and, you know, leaving the other lawyer in tears. I mean, we wish, but that's Hollywood. That's not reality. And, you know, I think that's, uh, that's so fascinating. And the reason why people might be asking, why are we starting off this discussion on capital punishment when it comes to uh, something is pay for, for, for lawyers. And, and I think it's such a critical point because Judge Learned Hand said years ago, uh, he observed that our procedure has always been haunted by the ghost of the innocent man convicted, but posited optimistically that it is an unreal dream. And I see that parallel today when I talk about capital punishment with so many of my friends, colleagues, family members. It's always that haunting idea of what if that person's innocent and I'm thinking in my head, okay, well, what if you're right? What if, but on the other side, well, what if there's no legal capacity to, in one instance, pay a competitive wage 
so that a lawyer is justifying the long hours going down that rabbit hole of the what if um, and instead paying them lower, well, then are we not di- shooting ourselves in, a f- in the foot in one way by not providing the capacity for the lawyers to feel that? Well, in many places in the United States, I think it's set up to fail. In other words, the commissars or the political leaders don't want the death penalty. Mm-hmm. So they'll either hobble the DA's office and not give them the money that they need to you know, just even maintain a few lawyers that could do it. And, um, and, and defense lawyers are not encouraged to learn it. And then the same people rise up and say, look, we can't find any decent lawyers to represent these people. And the arguments become self-fulfilling. Mm-hmm. We, we don't have adequate legal counsel. I got in, um, there's a hearing uh, in 12 years earlier that I think is up on, uh, I think I even have it on my website. And I find it amusing because it was my first and only personal encounter with now President Joe Biden. Biden has, is, was known, he was on the Judiciary Committee, and I was testifying in favor of capital punishment. And he started throwing out all these things about, okay, you know, can you tell me that, you know, people are decently represented in your state, that they have decent lawyers? You can't, not one of you can. I said, well, can I answer that question, Senator Biden? And we really got into it. I mean, you know, there, I would, we were speaking very loudly to each other. It was a very crowded hearing that got a lot of attention. Um, and, um, and I didn't back down. I'm a trial lawyer. It's an easy environment for me. I mean, having a senator yell at you might reduce some people to, you know, quivering jello, but it, it didn't. And I've never really had aspirations to run for any other political office. So to some degree, I don't care who I annoy. So I'm talking to the reporter for the New York Times after the hearing's over, and I feel this arm come around me, and it's Joe Biden. And he's saying, well, Mr. Markey, that was fun, wasn't it? I said, wow. yeah, it was, Senator. And I, it gave me, actually, I voted for him. And I, I, one of the reasons, besides the fact that I thought he was a much better candidate, was there was a, a humanity in that and an um, acknowledgment of, of you know, respect for different opinions, which ironically, when I was at the University of Oregon, you know, didn't happen. I mean, they, they weren't respected. Uh, you know, these were pariah ideas. And, you know, maybe some people can say, well, you know, the idea of even discussing killing other people is so disgusting that you ought to just be eliminated from. But that is a very illiberal um, society and one I frankly don't want to participate in. Uh, I'm just trying to see if I can actually share my screen because I just found the, the hearing before the Committee of the Judiciary U- United States Senate, uh, the second session from June 2000 with yourself and Senator then Senator Biden. And I wish oh. I could figure this out, but it's just not letting me. But anyways, yeah. I'll, I'll post it's it. about an hour and three minutes in, if I remember correctly. But it's, it, there's some, yeah, if you, if you have the opportunity to end, and I think it's quite entertaining. That's so fascinating. And I'm, I'm going to take a read on that afterwards. That's that's truly fascinating about Senator then Senator Biden in your exchange. The second point I want to raise with you when it came to internal capacity that you also raised at the Senate at that uh, testimony in 2012 was the need for video testimony, preferably as well as more investments in technologies to equip law enforcement and jurors with the necessary information to make an as informed assessment as possible. And the reason, again, I bring this up is because I'm, you know, there's a great book by Daniel Kahneman about noise. And we all bring our bias when it comes to uh, video testimony or audio testimony. We hear and see things differently. Um, And it's it's cut with our own bias. It's cut with our, our past. And sometimes we see things that others just don't see. And in your testimony, you, in a way, explicitly talk, discuss this to say, it's not enough that we have audio and video. It needs to be high quality, high resolution. We can't, without a shadow of a doubt, second guess what is being said and what is being seen. And I thought that was so fascinating to the debate of capital punishment. If we're going to provide this microscopic lens to capital punishment cases. That's a good way of putting it. The infrastructure to support it. We need that crystal clear audio and video. And I want to know from your experience, again, as as a district attorney, how vital that is for capital punishment cases. Well, everything, you know, 
any criminal case has to be proved beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, you know, you're potentially taking some part of a person's liberty. The death penalty is just all of that times five because you're potentially taking the person's life and it's ultra serious. So the point I was trying to make, and frankly, in 2021, almost a decade later, um, a lot of things have changed. COVID alone yes. has changed the way in which we communicate. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I, I've, I've appeared in court on camera because of, you know, floods or the convenience of the judge. And up until five years ago, I think there, it was really just partially judges just didn't like it. But the fact of the matter is there's now the ability, I mean, if you can get, if I had an expert witness for either the defense or prosecution, that's going to cost me $400 an hour, including travel time hmm. and airfare. I mean, this, and this is commonplace on both sides of a capital case. Uh, the only difference is that the defense has a totally open pocketbook. And I usually had, you know, a maximum of four figures. I tried several uh, murder cases where the defense was supplied with over fifty, sixty thousand dollars for witnesses in a single case, and I had twenty thousand dollars for all witnesses in all cases for the entire year, and I couldn't deficit spend, so I had to figure out a way to get a witness there for one or two thousand dollars because I just couldn't, you know, commit to a five or ten thousand dollar witness. Now, in a perfect world, maybe, you know, everybody would, and, and one of the mythologies is, oh, well, you know, people who are accused of murder often get, you know, terrible lawyers, drunk lawyers, sleeping lawyers, failed lawyers. You know, I'm sure there was a time in America where that was true. Yeah. I certainly haven't seen it in, in my almost 40 years of practice now. Right. Um, and, you know, they're, they're, you know, it's the same as medicine, you know, there's, you could go to a number of doctors who would maybe do a barely competent job and you'd want better than that. Um, but, and there's a few real, you know, zeros, the same as in the profession of law. But if we're going, one of the big questions um, is, are we going to do this at all? I mean, one of the arguments used by the opponents is because we can't recruit somebody and pay them 200,000 a year, because we can't provide this high quality. We, you know what the solution is? The solution is we'll just abolish this. We just won't have the death penalty. Then we won't have to make hard decisions like this. Right. Of course we will. And it's, this is already happening in many states that have abolished the death penalty. The next level is abolishing life imprisonment. It's happening mm -hmm. in many states. It's too harsh a punishment. It's inconceivable. Uh, even sentences of 25 years for say a 19 or 20 year old defendant impossible. We, Oregon just passed, changed the law from truth and sentencing to one where if you're 17 and you commit a murder, you can't be held any longer than 15 years, no matter what. So, um, Mr. Marquis, if I could interrupt, I just, I'm so fascinated by that point on, um, the, the amount of money you, you can spend as a prosecutor versus what the defense can spend. That's a very me... common conception. The general and if you watch movies, and I actually did a series of speeches, and I think I still have the materials where I showed a bunch of clips from movies and popular TV shows of capital of death penalty cases, where almost invariably the death penalty lawyer was the hero. I remember one was called True Crime. It was with uh, Clint Eastwood. Another one was another one was with James Woods. I mean, they were all these caricatures, and the caricature can be. The way I would normally say it is if I were on the on Alpha Centauri, the nearest sun, so theoretically one of the nearest planets that might have life, and the Alpha Centaurans or whatever they're called have a you know really sophisticated disc device so that they can watch TV programs from you know the western continent of Earth, or the western hemisphere. So what what are they going to learn about our legal system? Well, they're going to learn that in the North American continent, the, there are police states run by vicious racist police officers and their lackeys, the DA. And if a person is arrested for murder, they're likely to be minority, poor, and innocent. And they will generally be tortured by the police uh, to avoid uh, incriminating the real murderer who's probably 
either a police officer or in fact the district attorney himself, which many of these movies and TV shows are. And that if the case goes to trial, the, the DA will be sitting there surrounded by associates, usually you know, uh, riding in a limousine with a you know, police escort. The defense attorney will stumble into the courtroom. I mean, I can show you video clips of all this stuff, literally carrying a you know, battered uh, 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 briefcase and apologizing for being late. And he's often assisted by a dark but mysterious, gorgeous young woman who has her own reasons for doing it. And then the prosecutor is usually reduced to, to rubble by the brilliant uh, accusations of the defense attorney or in classic Perry Mason TV format, someone leaps up in the back of the room and announces, I did it. Um, and everybody's happy every week. Now, that may sound like a caricature, but it isn't. It's, it is a caricature, but it is the way in which um, these kinds of cases are portrayed in everything from pure entertainment to info uh, entertainment, which is supposedly based on it. And as a result, you see it in this Pew study. It, although you have 65% of the people agreeing that the death penalty is there, you have an enormous percentage, I think over 70, who believe that you know there are a bunch of innocent people on death row. Yes. And what's even more astounding, and this is reflected in other polls that are similar, uh, where you'll get a, when you ask the question, should the death penalty be available or should it be imposed in any case? And say 70% have it right. Then you, I don't know if it's the same 70%, probably not, will say, but there are a significant number of innocent people. And yes, I still think there should be the death penalty. If I believed that, I couldn't support the death penalty. Yeah. Um, and I've made it my mission for many years. I'm, slowing down and also i'm not in the business anymore but i would take um cases uh, i have a law review article that if you haven't read i think it's the best thing i've ever done it's called uh it's by it's in the university uh, or the northwest universities uh, the myth of the innocent this is available online but it's oh. the journal of criminal law and criminology it's uh, the article is called the myth of innocence it yeah. was published in winter 2005 yeah and um i make I'm, i mean this is a you know a, a, and i and i go through what at least in the early 2000s were several cases that were being promoted as an innocent person on death row or who had been on death row and if you do even a you know modest dive into the facts, they weren't innocent. They were guilty. I mean, people. There was a play that was very popular in the O's called the um, um, what was it called? I'm having a brain freeze on that. Um, something about innocence. Um, I'm, I'm just forgetting about it right now. Mm -hmm. HBO ended up promoting it. It's focused on four people who were innocent, they said. They were once on death row, but no longer. So I did a real deep dive and started researching the cases. So one case was a woman named Sonia Jacobs who had uh, been involved in them, well, had helped shoot uh, two police officers, one a Canadian constable, interestingly, who was visiting and doing a ride along with the Florida Highway Patrol on February 10th, 1976. Um, in, in Palm Beach County, Florida. And she was a very wealthy young white woman who had chosen to throw in her lot with some really dangerous criminals. She had bought a whole bunch of guns for them and they got pulled over by the police. Um, when they were caught driving the police car, they had already murdered uh, both the Canadian and the American officers. Um, the the man ended up being executed actually it was a really botched execution it's an elect electrocution that didn't go well and he essentially sort of crispy fried to death which got them off the yeah. uh, which really has nothing to do with the death penalty that's that's a mechanism issue right. but she only ended up doing about 11 or 12 years because she claimed she was innocent well she she wasn't innocent she pled guilty to a second degree murder plea in order to get out of jail. And then the same thing is repeated over and over 
with these other people. In the, so in other words, people who are declared innocent, if you scratch the surface a little bit, they pled guilty to get out of prison. There's a very thing, I didn't talk about the West Memphis Three. There, there are HBO movies, there are you know, TV shows about three young men who in 1993 murdered three little boys um, in Arkansas, um, close to Memphis, Tennessee, um, and a, a town called West Memphis, which is actually in Arkansas. And the general belief is that these are innocent young men who were uh, hoisted on a uh, an hysterical prosecutor who claimed satanic rituals and, and wrongly convicted them, and now they're all free. Well, some of that is true. Uh, the prosecutor did rely, I think, awfully heavily. But of course, the guy, the main defendant, wore all black eyeshadow uh, and pretended to be a vampire during the trial. So he didn't do himself any good. Uh, but they're all out of prison now. But they got out of prison after about 20 years by pleading guilty to first degree murder. So in other words, the state didn't want to fight him anymore. But the state wanted them to be convic convicted. I mean, they're convicted. Wow. They, they will always be convicted of murder. And this is one of the things that's gotten me angrier than anything else, because I think it's not a question of interpretation. It's not a question of how you look at it. Um, these are people who are legally, factually guilty, and they're being pawned off um, as innocents. And that completely perverts the argument. Um, you know, because if you ask anybody, including someone like me, should an innocent person go to prison? Of course not. Mm -hmm. And should you err on the side of, you know, uh, of making sure that you might lose a couple guilty people? Yes. But at what point, and you alluded to this earlier, do you, I mean, we can agree that it's better that five innocent serial killers go loose than one innocent. Okay. But about a thousand, what about 10,000? There's a point at which you you really aren't going to be able to say that anymore. You know, if you say, "Well, it's fine to me if a million murders walk free," so you're going to countenance, you know, ten million murders in the United States because you don't ever, ever, ever want to make a mistake. One of the most controversial things that I've said in interviews, and I'll be happy to provide it for you too, is when asked. That usually, it's in pretty bitter debates. And the other side at some point or the questioner will say, well, Mr. Marquis, will you concede that even if you know you haven't seen an innocent, that eventually in our system, an innocent will be convicted and sentenced to death? And I go, yep, I agree. And well, can't you now oppose it? I said, absolutely not. There are 12,000 people in North America that die from mistakes from prescriptions nobody's trying to kill them either the doctor screws up or the pharmacist screws up Twelve thousand people a year uh, do we you know do you see tv programs about oh my god we've got to close down the pharmacy system no um if there's probably more people there are definitely more people more like 20 or thirty thousand a year killed by medical mistakes do you know Am I saying that that's an acceptable number? Not at all. Uh, but, you know, we make these decisions for, for everything. And to artificially say, in this case, because the penalty is extreme, that we're going to construct some new standard or new test is ludicrous and unworkable. Uh, I actually heard the number of uh, uh, medical mistake deaths in the United States, I think are up to 40 to 50,000, but regardless. Probably, um, it's, you know, it depends on where you cut it. I mean, yeah. some of um, them are, you know, really bad ones like doctors yeah. cutting off the, you know, the wrong organ yeah. out. Some of them are much more subtle, like failing to detect a more exotic disease. Some yeah. of them are, you know, it's, it's, it's really just, sad, like, uh, uh, um, a pharmacist substituting morphine for baby aspirin yeah. for a child and the kid takes two tablets and, he, and can't breathe yeah. and uh, dies. It's terrible. You know, uh, uh, Mr. Marquis, the reason why I also wanted to bring you on is because of your, your background as a district attorney and the, the, the complexity that you saw in your career um, in all of the cases that you tried and that you were part of. And as you speak, I, 
I can't help, and I don't mean to put like a tinfoil hat, but I wonder, I truly do wonder um, on, you know, the, not only the TV shows and the movies that we see and the news, you know, I noticed that the BBC always, uh, on their news website, they always put up, you know, who's on trial for the death penalty or who's about to be executed. It's, it's so fascinating right. to me. That's well, always the BBC's on- got, I, I love, I've lived overseas and I, and I subscribe to the BBC, but they've got some incredibly irritating woke practices in their news. When it comes to the death penalty, it's fascinating that they always put that kind of front and center. But I want to know about, again, that point about, you know, 50 to 60,000 for the defense versus, you know, 5,000 for the prosecution. Well, not even that. I mean, I was outspent 20 to 30 to one regularly murder cases. And then in a death penalty case, you can probably double that. And that's, yeah. and Oregon, you know, is, it's, you know, it, it's, it's not a Southern state. It's not a poor state, Yeah, but it's not California or New York. Right. But I, I was in for, I spent one year doing defense work in the middle of my career. I've been a prosecutor for about 10 years. It was about it was a long time ago, about 30 years ago. And, um, and I went to work and because I had tried a murder case, I was what's called death qualified. That meant I was eligible to defend a murder case. And the state of Oregon went, like most states, has a really elaborate system of screening lawyers who can do it. They, you know, you don't want to, contrary to what you see on television or movies, you do not want to give somebody two years out of law school, um, you know, a, a death penalty case. In fact, I think you had to, I don't know what the right, I think at the time you had to practice at least 10 years, you had to have at least five years increasingly serious, and more importantly, you had to have actually tried a murder case. Hmm. And, and now, you know, if you look at all lawyers in America, although, you know, maybe one tenth or one hundredth of one percent of the lawyers in America have ever tried a murder case. It's just, it's not, I mean, you can take a really elaborate operation and compare it to doctors, but mm. just not very many people have done it. So there were a lot of qualifications to be a defense attorney. Mm. And the state of Oregon made sure if I wanted to, it was a very interesting experience because I defended three capital defendants and none of my clients got executed. Hmm. And it was just amazing how much money I had available. I would be getting unsolicited packets from expert witnesses saying, this is, you know, they learned that I was appointed to this case, you know, we can, you know, make you this model and we well, have yeah, the expert witness only five, $10,000. And I've had cases where I've had, I remember one at murder case where, um, um, I would have normally sought the death penalty, except the young man was 16 when he committed the murder. And in Oregon, and I agree with this, you can't, uh, a juvenile committing murder can never be considered for the death penalty, but he was being tried as an adult. So the defense claimed that he had been, you know, dropped on his head as a kid. I'm oversimplifying it. But, um, so I, and they were calling a neurologist and a neuropsychologist each of these people was costing five, 10,000 bucks. And I didn't have any money. So I spent eight hours on the internet. It's kind of like what you're describing. You had to do to find me. And I found a couple papers that I could barely understand. And, and fortunately, one of them was a very nice um, Chinese American doctor in South Carolina. And I explained to him what they were trying to do, which to make it as simple as possible, they were claiming that a fairly sophisticated test that's an extension of a CAT scan called a PET scan. It means positronic emission tomography. Most people are familiar with CAT scans. Uh, PET scans are sort of 3D and um, they're unusual and they're expensive. So in any event, and usually done of the brain and it shows the brain in colors ranging from red or white to uh, greens and blues. And the colors indicate activity. Well, the defense was claiming that by, by showing uh, PET images of the defendant, of the killer, you could tell that, that he was impaired, that he had some sort of magical part of his brain that wasn't working. And of course, you know, I, I can't, I don't know about radiology. So I'm talking, explaining this to the doctor and he says, that's just nonsense. Mm. He says, 
That's like, you know, you know, taking somebody's temperature and saying they're a witch because it's over 102. And he explained to me that, look, you can identify different areas of the brain uh, as having more activities or less, but we have no idea what that means. Mm -hmm. We certainly don't know that it means that they don't have a conscience. I mean, you know, that, that's really sort of medieval is to think that, I mean, they used to believe that people had humors, which you could actually extract from the body. And if you took the right humor out, then the, uh, you know, the person wouldn't be bad anymore. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's very hard to get people to understand and I, how incredibly one-sided the system is. And I'll, let me say this, which will surprise some people. It's supposed to be that way because, mm -hmm. and I would tend to agree that if the state is seeking to kill someone, you should give that person's lawyer every resource possible. Mm -hmm. um, there's almost no time to say no. Another murder case I tried, the one I did three times. Um, one, the defendant has been in prison since he was 18. And in 1997, which is the third trial and would have been um, 10 years since he went in, they put on the witness list a name of a young woman in London. So I was trying to figure out what the heck she could possibly do. They ended up flying her over from London and they didn't call her as a witness. She wow. was there for emotional support, but the taxpayers paid three or $4,000 to bring a pen pal wow. to make the uh, killer feel more comfortable. You know, <laughs> you know, I mean, Mr. Markey, we spent just about an hour discussing the internal capacity of the legal system when it comes to capital punishment. Well, when it comes to the legal system uh, as it is, and we're scratching the surface. And that's exactly what I wanted to do today. I wanted to talk specifically about the capacity of the legal system. And you've shed light specifically on video and audio evidence, making sure it's the best, how we pay our lawyers, making sure that's the best, uh, but also the fact of uh, you know the defense being out uh, outspending the prosecution. I mean, that to me- Well, you know, my, what, the moral... one thing I have over and over again is, let's just have honesty in this debate. I mean, you can say, look, there's reasons why you have to provide the defense with all this. It's not, it's counterintuitive to the conventional wisdom. Um, the, the fact of the matter is, you know, there may be, have been literally one or two innocent people on death row in the last 30 years, but it hasn't been, you know, 50% of them. And, and, and these mythologies, which are encouraged and incorporated in popular culture, um, stand in the way of having an honest discussion. One can still oppose the death penalty and concede all the things I've talked about. Yeah. Um, and and it, none of them lessen the need for due process or lessen the need to prove absolutely that someone is, is guilty. And and allow a jury to acquit somebody if they're not sure if they, you know, they did, they're not sure whether we got the right guy. Um, that's not, not the way the system is supposed to work. And, uh, but, you know, you know, just the one thing that I, you reacted to a lot of people do is this business about what are the resources and people are, you know, academics just refuse to believe what I'm saying. They just go, that's just not possibly true. And I go, no, you know, I can produce testimony to you. I can tell you, you know, what happened. It, and, and of course, one of the dangers is I can only speak absolutely authoritatively about Oregon because in the United States, states are free to have um, their own legal system with some peculiarities. Yes, we are governed by a overwhelming, over, overreaching constitution. Uh, but there are enough differences that someone can say, well, you've never, you've never tried a death penalty case in Alabama or Texas, so you don't know what you're talking about. And there is some truth in that. But, um, but I think that's just the way around it. I, there's no qualifications for who can be involved in the debate. I mean, that's uh, intellectual snobbism of the worst sort. That would be like say, me saying, well, you haven't actually participated in a capital case as either a defendant, a lawyer, or an investigator, so you really can't talk about it. That's ridiculous. Yes. It is a matter of great public uh, interest, and um, it's a, you know, in a perfect society, 
we would believe that as people get more civilized and we have more sort of general controls that crime will just continue to drop. And then the idea is that you also, you refine or limit your punishment. We no longer chop people's hands off for stealing apples. We've abolished the death penalty for anything except certain murders. So the belief would be that eventually it'll just completely disappear. It's not what happens. I'm trying to remember the name for the mathematical figure, but what really happens, and not just regards the death penalty, in civilized societies is conduct of a certain kind decreases and then it essentially levels out. You are never going to have a crime-free society mm -hmm. unless you give up all civil liberties and yeah. you know live under the heel of the Gestapo. I'm sure it was yeah. probably to live uh, you know as long as you were an Aryan, you know, German in yeah. in Berlin in 1937. But yes. Uh, no, you're completely right. In, in that, that's a that's a truly fascinating point. Um, the, and again, it's so fascinating that you mentioned that last piece about um, the 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 curve going down and the the politics plays such a a vital role when it, when it, or a very interesting role when it comes to capital punishment because it goes against public opinion in my opinion, right? Like we are divided down the middle, but yet there's just this overwhelming uh, support against or support against capital punishment. Uh, but also, it flies in the face of our ability as humans to try a case to make sure that it is we're, we're trying to remove as much noise slash bias out of our assessment of a case and look at it as unbiased as we can um and our ability to say yes this is actually worthy of a death penalty which in fact the majority of americans canadians and other people around the world support in the event of these extreme circumstances and yeah, so i mean the classic discussion and i had this with my parents and people I care about in my life and relatives, I'd say, okay, I'd say, oh, I'm against the death penalty. I'd say, All right, what about your niece there who's three years old? Someone, God forbid, comes in, tortures her and you know, rapes her and kills her. Oh, I don't wanna think about that. I said, I'm sorry, it happens. I hope it never happens to her, but it happens. So what do you think then? Well, I'm gonna go kill the person, but I don't want the state doing it. I said, I see. So you, so you should be able to commit a, basically a uh, blood revenge killing like in a sharia law state you know yeah. at that point people aren't react reacting logically they're reacting emotionally yeah. and um we don't we're not a sharia law nation i don't want to live in one where you know there's several options the, the victim's family can forgive the victim's family can demand payment or they can demand blood vengeance by which they can, you know, make the person suffer almost as much as their loved one did, which I don't think is the right way to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Marquis, that's a very fascinating uh, uh, perspective because emotion is is run runs extremely high in the capital punishment debate uh, um, issue. I want to thank you, first of all, for coming on and sharing and being so courageous to share your opinion as much as you have online in your work. Um, I think it's such a fascinating perspective what you bring up. I'm so glad we were able to tackle just this small piece of the capital punishment debate. I did not want this to get unwieldy, and I'm glad it did not. Um, and uh, again, your experience as a district attorney talking about pay and evidence and uh, the audio and video evidence are so critical elements to when we're talking about capital punishment. Um, so the last question I had for you is, you know, where do you see us going from here? How do we continue having these, these open-ended conversations on capital punishment? Well, as you pointed out, and I hadn't really thought about it, with the privatization of the media, it gets harder and harder to find opposing viewpoints where there might be, as there is about this subject, you know, genuine, I mean, I think my viewpoint is actually the majority viewpoint, but it certainly is not an outlier opinion of five or 10%. Um, and there are, and I think, you know, a, a complex issue in our, in our societies is how do we make sure that we have intelligent discussions or even, I mean, I've found myself being invited to high school classes, college classes, law school classes, and most of the students would act answer in a way what you've said, which is I just, you know, there isn't anything out there. Um, and of course I know where to look. So I'm typing individual names in. I'm not just typing, you know, who's there for that. Yeah. And that's a critical part of a um, liberal with a small L 
intelligent, open society is, is having genuine discussions about things and not saying something is protected or, or not allowed. Mm -hmm. um, it, th that concerns me. Um, and it also concerns me because I, I know people even who did what I did to some degree who um, advocate for what was basically just said, I can't, the cost is too great to my career. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to do this because I'm going to be labeled, uh, you know, a savage or whatever. And that's really sad because we, you, we need to be able to have these discussions about, you know, whether it's abortion, uh, the death penalty, global warming, uh, birth control, <laughs> you know, that they're, they're hard discussions and they do impinge on people's beliefs yeah. and sometimes their religious beliefs. But, um, you know, I, the idea of openness and, you know, I, you, you probably have the ability uh, for people watching your podcast, um, I, I'd ask you to put up my website. It's not monetized. There's no ads, so I don't benefit yeah. if I get a million viewers or two a week. Uh, but I've written at least thirty pieces on capital punishment that are included in the can. It's simply www.coastda.com. Coastda is C O A S T D A which is also my email address, which is not hard to find out, coastda at gmail.com. And um, it, it republishes a number of the op-eds I've written and also has links to those two videos that you discussed, the one at, uh, in New York City and um, uh, the debate in the uh, University of Tennessee in, 19, in 2009. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Markey, for sharing as much as you have. I'll link everything in the, the, the descript description. Thank below. You. And uh, I, I'm, I'm sure we'll continue this conversation on capital punishment. And thank you again for, for, for shedding thank light you. on this very important topic.